Romans chapter 1. We're going to be looking at a topic in which I've titled The Bankruptcy of Atheism. The Bankruptcy of Atheism. Starting in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Let's pray. Father, regardless of the reasons why we have gathered here today, unless You meet with us, we are here in vain. It is our desire that You will do whatever it takes to receive the greatest amount of glory due to Your name. You alone are awesome. That word should be set apart for you alone because you are awesome alone. I ask that as we gather here, we would have a full equipping that would be ready and prepared to talk to any atheist, agnostic, any skeptic that adheres to the tenets of the flying spaghetti monster, that we need not shriek away, but we would trust you knowing that it's your gospel that is the power of God onto salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. George Clooney, he said, I don't believe in heaven and hell. I don't believe in God. All I know is that as an individual, I won't allow this life, the only thing I know to exist, to be wasted. I gave George Clooney a gospel track. I'm not sure if he read it. A friend of mine gave Brad Pitt a gospel track in the making of the movie Moneyball, and in so doing, he was fired the next day. But Brad Pitt, his friend, said, I'm probably 20% atheist, 80% agnostic. I don't think anyone really knows. You'll either find out or not when you get there, and until then, There's no point thinking about it. Now, I prefer the words of Charles Darwin when he said, the question whether there exists a creator and ruler of the universe, this has been answered in the affirmative by the highest intellects that have ever lived. I don't agree with a lot of what that man has said, but I agree this time. And I agree with him more than Brad Pitt and George Clooney. Atheism has been defined by some, and it changes every year because they have nobody in charge. It has been defined as a disbelief or a lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. Matt Dillahunty, P.Z. Myers, they don't like that definition, and I don't blame them. They say it's a worldview that is adamant that God does not exist. I've defined it this way. It's a worldview which pretends God does not exist because they love their sin. They don't want an authoritative figure inside their life telling them what is right and wrong, good and bad, sacred and secular. Now, I have broken down this message into four sections. Uh, The knowledge of the atheist, the heart of the atheist, Questions of the atheist and the need of the atheist. Now, the the knowledge of the atheist is really simple. As we read in our text, Romans chapter 1, 
that everybody knows that God exists. And we're going to take a look at that. Secondly, it'll be the heart of the atheist. Psalm 14, verse 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. It doesn't say the brilliant biologist has said in his heart there is no God, or the mesmerizing mathematician has said in his heart there is no God. It says the fool. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. And as we look at this section, we're going to look at a lot of foolish, self-refuting statements that atheists must adhere to because there's no God inside their life. And then thirdly, we will look at the questions of an atheist. And this section is dealing primarily with questions that I get when I'm out on the college campuses from atheists. And I thought to myself, if I was to sit through a lecture like this, what I would really desire are answers, quick answers, to the hardest hitting questions. And that's what this section is about. And finally, the last section is the greatest need of the atheist, and that is to be born again. And I echo the words of J.C. Ryle, unless a man is born again, he's going to wish one day he was never born at all. So, firstly, as we look at it, it's the knowledge of the atheist. The atheist knows God exists. This is what our text says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God himself has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God doesn't believe in atheism. Our society likes to say it's the other way around, that atheists don't believe in God. But God doesn't believe in atheism, doesn't believe in atheists. That God has made it very clear that He is real. There is this general revelation that God has given to every man, woman, and child that has brought a shadow to this planet. They're without excuse. Without excuse. We do not need to argue with an atheist about the existence of God because they know God exists. They have suppressed that truth and unrighteousness, and they begin to worship creation instead of a creator. I was asked while I was speaking at a university not too long ago, what happens to the individual who has never heard about God? And the answer is simple. If they die in their sins, they will go to hell. There's no place you can go on this planet and find a people group who are ignorant about whether or not God exists. What they need is special revelation. They have general revelation, duh, there's creation, there must be a creator, but they need that special revelation. And this is why we send missionaries. If they can get saved, is what I told the student on this campus, if they can get saved without getting and going through Jesus Christ, then we should not send missionaries. We should send general contractors who will build these walls around the 1040 window, hoping that a missionary does not get inside there. They preach the gospel, and now they're held accountable. By virtue of the fact that God has given them general revelation, they now need special revelation, and this is why we go. And this is why the message is urgent. Someone once said, if not you, well then who? And if not now, well then when? At what point do we rise up and be the light by which God has commanded us to be? It's not an invitation. It's a declaration. That's our message. You must repent. You must place your faith in Jesus Christ 
alone. I don't invite people to get right with God. I do what the Bible says. I command them, unless you repent, my friend, you will perish. And I understand that's not how you win friends and influence people, but I would much rather be considered somebody's enemy and tell them the truth than pat them on the back and say everything's okay when everything's not okay. Because it's at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let it be said, the only truth you know is the truth you want to know. God needs to grant repentance that leads to the truth. Firm believer, absolutely. Each person needs to decide for himself how much truth he can handle. An actor once said, you cannot handle the truth. Jesus said to his disciples, man, there's many things I wish to tell you, but you can't handle it at this point. Do you realize that as a Christian, as a child of God, you are as knowledgeable about God and God's Word as you want to be? God, how deep can you take me? How deep will you let Him take you? You have as much of Scripture memorized as you want to memorize. You've shared the gospel with as many people as you've wanted to share the gospel with. The knowledge of the atheist, in today's society, there's a battle for truth. George Orwell said, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who proclaim it. So you need to decide the things that I share with you. They're just words. W-O-R-D-S, words. Unless they're true. And if they're true, they require a response. Jesus said, I am the truth. We live in a society that calls up, down, right, wrong, left, right. You decide for yourself what is true, and I'll decide for myself what is true. Wayne Grudem, he said, God's words are not simply true in the sense that they conform to some standard of truthfulness outside of God. Rather, they are truth itself. They are the final standard and the definition of truth. What is true? God's Word is true. You want to know God's heart on a matter? Read His Word. Draw near to God and He's going to draw near to you. Justin Peter said, why? No, it was... uh, the missionary who died at the hands of the people who he was trying to reach, uh, Elliot, Jim Elliot, he said, why do you need a voice when you have a verse? Christians are waiting to go, waiting for this call from God. I'm willing to go to the highways, byways, gutterways. I'm willing to knock on my neighbor's door. I'm willing to go to the universities. I'm willing to hand a gospel tract to that person should God call me to go. God's called you to go. You should be saying, listen, I'm willing to stay should God call me to stay. In the meantime, I'm going to go. You don't need a voice when you have a verse. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Start with the man in the mirror. Get the message down. I laminate the gospel. I like to put it inside the shower. I like to put it inside my car at work. Everywhere I go where the gospel is just embedded on my head, it's on my eyelids, whether I sleep, whether I'm awake, whether I blink, the gospel is just a part of us. Remember, it's only good news if it gets there in time. We need to make sure that it gets there in time. Without the foundation of God's Word, there is no objective truth. We need to proclaim it from the mountaintop from the outhouse to the White House, that God is not on trial. I don't need to prove to you God exists. 
Without the foundation of Scripture, you cannot make sense of your own worldview. And you borrow from my worldview to make sense of right and wrong. And we're going to get into that, what exactly that means in just a moment. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is His delight. So, truth be told, people are not seeking after the truth. That's the truth. There's none who seek after God. No, not one. We as Christians, we have inside information about the atheist. Namely, they know that God exists. And we get caught in this quagmire where, man, if I could just memorize the cosmological argument for the existence of God or the theological argument for whatever these things are, when in reality they know God exists, I can get to the heart of the matter. Concerning the knowledge of the atheist, he already knows God exists. So what is the problem then? It's the heart of the atheist. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. As you look at Mount Rushmore, you can easily come to the conclusion, even though you have no idea who the architect was, who the designer was, that there was a designer. As you look at the human eyeball, something like 137 million light-sensitive cells, instantaneous reproduction, wide-angle lens, I need to convince you that my eye was created when I cannot convince you that Mount Rushmore was created. Come on, we have a problem. My friend, Cy Ten Bruggenkate, he says, let me get this straight. You have a heart that can survive for 70 plus years off of eating donuts. <laughs> and you're convinced that it happened by chance? It's not the scholarly scientist who said in his heart there is no God. It's not the brilliant biologist who said in his heart there is no God. It's not the mesmerizing mathematician. It is the fool. It's the fool. It's the fool who can look at creation all around and say there is no God. There's no God. We don't get to choose what is true. We only get to choose what we do about it. What are you going to do about it? Listen, the suppression of truth will always lead to the perversion of truth. Always. And when you suppress the truth of God, you will always do it in unrighteousness. Now, this might surprise some of you, but we do not have the original 66 books of the Bible. We only have fragments, we have some manuscripts written on all sorts of material. But the earliest New Testament manuscript fragment that we have, it's found in the John Rylands Museum in England. The earliest fragment, the John Rylands fragment, it's called the P-52. P stands for the type of material that it was written on, papyrus. In 52, it means that is the 52nd logged papyrus in the papyrus family that was ever discovered. So the earliest fragment we have is the P52, the John Rylands manuscript. And what is written on that fragment? Amongst other things, what is truth? One of the single-handedly best questions ever to be asked to the greatest authority of the, on the subject, Jesus Christ, by Pontius Pilate. And then he did not wait around 
for the answer. What is truth? What is it? That which conforms to reality is what the dictionary says. I like to say, that which conforms to the mind of God. Whatever God has said is correct is true. Everybody else, get in line. If God says it, that settles it whether you believe it or not. God said it, that settles it. Well, why is this so important? Well, because atheists claim that they are in the truth. And then when pressed, you find out that they're really relativistic in their worldview. And what is relativism? Simply put, it's the philosophical position that all points of view are equally valid and that all truth is relative to the individual. That, all, that means that all moral positions, all religious systems are defined by each individual. There's no right, there's no wrong. You decide and she decides, and I don't care what religion you are, you get to decide as well. You want to see it acted out? You want to see what it looks like? Watch this video. So does it matter how we live our life on this earth? I mean, Hitler did just what he wanted to do. No, and I, don't think, I don't think it matters. I think we have free will of anything. There's no good or bad, but karma does exist. So whatever you do, it comes back to you. So you think it's okay to rape little children for fun? Yes, I think it's okay. What? I, I think it's fine. Oh, <laughs> will, we have total will. We can do whatever we want. That's why, you know, we're here. All right, let me ask you. If you, if you, if you had kids, would you let him babysit your kids? I mean, I think, I, or maybe he needs to rephrase what he said. I, I, I'll say right now, I definitely don't well, think he's being cons he, Well, he's being consistent. We can do whatever we want, whatever we choose to. And it's all okay? And it's all okay. So you think what Hitler did really wasn't wrong? He thinks it was great. Some people actually- I'm saying you, you don't think what he did was wrong? I think what he did was wrong. How, how could it be really wrong if he just wanted to do it because you said you could do anything? Well, people, you know, they live different. You said you don't like. You say you don't like it. Yeah, that was his will. You know, he. It was his choice. But it wasn't really wrong. It wasn't really wrong because there is no good or wrong. Have you ever told that to a Jewish person? No. Don't. Behold, the future generation. Atheists come along and we see how foolish their heart is. They say such statement that says, you can't know anything for sure. There's so many worldviews. There's so many belief systems. Are you as arrogant as those Christians who say, you're right? You can't know anything for sure. And what do I say when somebody says that? Do you know that for sure? Let's go back. You can't know anything for sure. Do you know that for sure? Do you know for sure we don't know anything for sure? Yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> you Christians are so judgmental. Is that your judgment? If it's wrong to be judgmental, well, then why are you judging me? Why are you judging my judgment? Uh, well, nobody's right. What do you mean nobody's right? Well, everybody claims to be right. Nobody's right. All right, let me get this straight. Are you right that nobody's right? Because if you are right that nobody is right, well, then you're wrong about nobody being right because you claim to be right. And that's not right. Right? <laughs> There's no such thing as absolute truth. Why would they say that? Because the moment you claim that there is truth, it has to be foundational and it has to be objective, which means there's somebody in charge. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Is that true? Is it true that there's no such thing as truth? Uh, can I have a moment? I'll just rip my own hair out. That's the logic of the atheist. Sproul said, as the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, so the denial of God is at the height of foolishness. You know, I ask atheists all the time, are there moral absolutes? Usually they'll say no. 
And I go, really? Rape, right or wrong? And I go, well, that's wrong. I said, how do you know that's wrong? I know for the same reason you know that it's wrong. And I go, I agree with you, because God has given us a conscience. Con means with, science means knowledge. Every time I do something wrong, I do it with knowledge that it's wrong. But here, Mr. Atheist, you don't believe in a conscience. You believe that we live in a naturalistic, materialistic world. How do you know that it's wrong? What you're left with is saying, I don't think that it's wrong. But you can't objectively say that it's wrong. And occasionally, I'll come across someone that'll say, you know what, I don't know if it's wrong, if rape is wrong. They don't need an argument at that point. They need a therapist. We do not need to explain to an atheist, an Anglican, Episcopalian, a Mormon, maybe to a dog or a cat, but they won't understand us anyways. There are moral absolutes, and there's a moral lawgiver. He cares about right and wrong, and there's going to come a time where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I was in Huntington Beach, California. I was open-air preaching. There was an atheist that came up to the microphone, and I said, sir, you don't believe that there's moral absolutes. What do you think about pornography? Is it good or bad? He goes, well, there's nothing wrong with it. I said, at what age would you like your precious little daughter standing next to you to get involved in that noble profession? He didn't have anything to say. It reminded me of the words of Greg Bonson, the late great presuppositional apologist, buried not too far from me in Whittier, California. He said, it is not our job to open people's hearts. It is our job to close their mouths in love. When we speak the truth, we must speak it in love. As you can see, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, and it's the fool. It's the fool that has said in his heart, there is no God. Next, we look at the questions. First, we look at the knowledge. The atheist knows God exists. When they say, I don't know God exists, they're either lying or they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Either way, God is right. Secondly, we have the heart of the atheist, the fool, has said in his heart, there is no God. Next, we have the questions, the questions of an atheist. The mind of the atheist, it's at enmity with God. It's altogether a vain thing, and his so-called wise questions that we begin to hide away from are foolish in and of themselves as well. They may not be as self-refuting as the questions and the statements and the assertions we just looked at, but they're actually not very difficult. Within 60 minutes of study, you can come across the top answers to the top three, four questions on Richard Dawkins' website. I had spoken at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania on the issue of theodicy. It's the problem of evil. If God is loving and all-powerful, why is there evil? Why is there suffering in the world? And then I opened it up for Q&A from the faculty and the students. And I said, hey, I saw on Reddit's website and on Richard Dawkins' website that this event was the top trending item on those websites. They're saying, ask the Christian this question, then ask him this. You'll corner him with this. I said, listen, you, you, you can ask all the questions you want. I, I, I don't have all the answers. I have an answer for the hope that lies within me, and I, you know, I probably do have an answer for whatever question you're going to come up with because it's the same questions that are being regurgitated time and time again. And if you want to corner me, go ahead. But I want to use this as an ad hoc opportunity for that question where you go, hey, I'm just kind of working through this. Well, welcome to the conversation. We're all kind of working through things. We can get into a debate. I'm going to win because I have the answers. I remember when Ken Ham had debated Bill Nye, the not-so-science guy. And I remember Ken asking the question, who do you think is going to win? 
and it was Ray Comfort, Easy, and myself that were sitting there. And I remember saying, I think whoever shares the gospel is going to win. And I'm not expecting too much from Bill Nye. It's the gospel that is the power of God onto salvation. It's the gospel. So, let's tackle some of these questions, but we must always remember as we do so, but by the grace of God, there go I. What does Scripture say? But the wisdom that is from above, it's first pure, and then it's peaceable. It's gentle. It's willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's without partiality. It's without hypocrisy. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A lot of times when a question is asked, I might say, hey, that's a good question. That reminds me. How many lies do you think you've told over the course of your life? I'm not trying to run away from their question. There's good questions that are being asked, but that question, it's not holding them back from becoming a Christian. Their love for self and sin is what holds them back. Remember that as you have an answer, the answer for the question that's being asked. I ask students all the time, I say, hey, you got some good questions. Hey, quick poll, really quick. Hey, if I could answer all of your questions to your satisfaction, and you walk away and you go, whoa, man, that was a great answer. Would you be willing to bow your knee and to worship God and to confess Jesus Christ as Lord right here in front of everybody? And 100% of the time, I get no as the answer. And I say, what you just determined, what you showed all of us publicly, is that you're not looking for answers. You're trying to do away with the answer. You don't want God to exist for the same reason a bank robber doesn't want a police officer to exist. It's true. Well, the church is filled with hypocrites. Quickly, I say, well, Jesus never said to follow my people. He said to follow me. And sure, there's pretenders. I'll say the pulpit is filled with pretenders a lot of times. I've met many a pastor who I've questioned their salvation, where I'm wondering, but let's not confuse the fact that there, there are pretenders, and God will sort that out on that day. The only person who can actually be a hypocrite is somebody with a moral foundation, with somebody who says, you know what, this moral action It's wrong. It's wrong to rape. Therefore, if you now rape someone, he's a hypocrite. But if you have no moral foundation whatsoever, you're just kind of floating through the air going, hey, look at me. I don't have any moral absolutes. Well, then you'll never be a hypocrite because you have no spine. You consider the words of Sam Harris in his book, Letter to a Christian Nation. If I can wave a magic wand and get rid of either rape or religion, I would not hesitate to get rid of religion. Really? We've drifted that far? Foolish. Why do bad things happen to good people? Quick answer, that only happened once and he volunteered. I was at Long Beach State last year, and there was this 29-year-old student who came up to me and said, hey, uh, I have a quick question. I just finished debating this professor who teaches debate on the university for the last 17 years. And she came up to me afterwards, and she said, hey, um, quick question off on the side. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Now, because I'm not clairvoyant, as a lot of you may think, I have to follow it up with, why do you ask? Because I don't know why they're asking. 
Does she want me to philosophize on her or does she need me to personally come alongside her because she's going through something? I said, why do you ask? And she said, I'm 29 years old. I've been diagnosed with cancer. I have less than six months to live. Both of my parents are dead. I have no siblings, no boyfriend. When I die, my name dies. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out if God is good. Why do such bad things happen to good people? She didn't want the ontological argument, does she? (laughs) Whatever that is. I came alongside of her and I said, listen, I, I think you're asking the wrong question. It's not why do bad things happen to good people or why is this going to happen to me? God, well, why is it that you've told me that I'm about to die? It's, God, how kind are you to remind me that I'm about to die? How kind are you, God, that you would remind me that I have an appointment with death? No, I know theoretically that 10 out of 10 of us are going to die. 150,000 people every day pass from time on into eternity. That's 54 million people every year. Most of these people are planning for their tomorrows, but tomorrow never comes. God, why are you so kind that you would remind me that I have an appointment with death? I said, man, that's the question you should be asking. Because God hasn't reminded all of those people that they have an appointment with death. It is appointed man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. I begin to share the gospel with her, the good news. It's not good views, it's good news. Warren Wiersbe said, you're a Christian because somebody cared to share with you. Now it's your turn. She began to weep. And because I'm a guy, I pretended to weep. <laughs> but I gave her the truth, right? Spurgeon said, if, if they can't see tears in your eyes, let them, let them see the tears in your voice. Let them hear the tears in what you say. Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, that only happened once. He volunteered. His name was Jesus. Bodhi Bauckham said, you're asking the wrong question. It's, God, why didn't you kill me in my sleep for the thoughts that I had against you and all of humanity yesterday? Why did you give me a good sound sleep? That's the question you should be asking. Well, Jesus never said to follow my people. He said to follow me. Why do bad things happen to good people? Hmm. C.S. Lewis said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I get this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? That's a good question. You can't say something is evil unless you know that which is good. You cannot have evil without good, and you cannot have good without God. We'll get into that in one of the upcoming questions. You can't trust the Bible because it was written by men, right? And everybody knows that men make mistakes. I was asked this question doing a special with Daystar, 19 years old. His name was Michael. You can't trust the Bible because it was written by men. I said, yeah, I don't want to assume the gender, but you look like a man. Are you secretly trying to tell me that you can't be trusted? Or maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're trying to tell me that you can't trust public school science textbooks because those are written by men. After all, everybody knows that men make mistakes. That wasn't the point there, was it? Now, when you share these things, when you speak these things, you speak them in love, and you, you, you could answer differently. 
You can be a little bit more macho for the men, a little bit more sensitive for the females or the guys if you're in California where I live. But we speak the truth and we do not hide behind it. When you ask me a question, I'm going to use the Bible as my source of authority. So it makes sense. When you ask, I'm going to extract from the Word of God. I'm going to use the Bible. What are you going to use? What? Well, I'm going to use the Bible as my source of authority. What are you going to use? Uh, I'm going to use uh, my knowledge. I'm going to use my mind and uh, common sense for my answers. I'm going to use science, even though the word just means knowledge. And I say, huh, well, how do you know your mind is rational? Let me give you an example. I'll use something like this. I'll say, would you agree with me that there's people in the world that are out of touch with reality in comatose states, in hospitals? Maybe it was a drug-induced state. Maybe they were born that way. Maybe they were in a car accident, but they're out of touch. They're in a coma. They cannot communicate the way you and I are communicating. Would you agree with me that there's people like that in the world? Atheists say, yeah, of course. Would you also agree with me, Mr. Atheist, that they don't know they're in that state? They go, yeah, I would concede that. Well, then how do you know you're not one of them? You just said they, they don't know they're in that state. How do you know you're not in that state? How do you know this isn't the matrix? How do you know you're not a brain in a vat? You're hooked up to diodes and you're being fed information. And any answer you give me, you're going to have to use your reasoning skills to validate your reasoning skills. And that's circular reasoning. Now you can ask me the same question. I know I'm not in that state, using the Bible as my source of authority, because God, He's not given me a, a spirit of fear, but one of power and a sound mind. I've got a sound mind, and I can account for why. You can too. You just don't know it. You can't trust the Bible. I would dare to say you don't have a problem with the Word of God. You have a problem with the God of the Word. You don't want God to exist. The Bible, it's not one book. 66, man, written over a period of almost 1,500 years, 40 different authors, different occupational backgrounds, one central main theme. How does man avoid hell and come into a relationship with the God of the universe? with God. He made the seasons, and He made seafood, He made surfing and sunsets and sex. God, He's offering you a full reprieve, but you got to come to Him on His terms. You got to repent, and you got to trust in Him. The Bible, the issue at hand is truth. Where do you get truth within your worldview? If you're going to say the Bible can't be trusted, what you're saying is, all right, here's the Bible, it can't be trusted. It's not true. What are you comparing it to in order to say that it's false? You come along, you say, all right, here it is. This is what's true, and this demonstrates the Bible is false. Well, that thing, that religious writ is now your source of authority. My question is, how do you know that's true? In order to say the Bible is false, you have to be comparing it to something that is true. And you got nothing, baby, nada. You're worse than a zero. You're a rimless zero. There's nothing there. That's your worldview. Could you be wrong about Christianity being true? Could you be wrong about God being real? Now, a lot of people, they come along and they say, yeah, you know, I, I guess I could be wrong. And I, I don't think that's, that's, that's a safe, fair statement. If I was going to demonstrate to you that I have 
the fastest truck in the world. And you said, prove to me you got the fastest truck in the world, but you cannot use your truck to do so. That's lunacy. I must use my truck to demonstrate that my truck is the fastest truck in the universe. I can bench more than anybody. Oh, yeah? Prove it, but don't use your muscles. Look, the Bible is God's Word. God says it's His Word. Well, you can't do that. Yeah, because it's the ultimate source of authority. A little bit more to it than that, but yeah, that's the answer. Could you be wrong about Christianity being true? I was asked this question on a university once. I said, what would it take to convince you that your parents are aliens? And he said, well, I guess I should remain a little open-minded. I went, what? Is this on camera? You're open-minded that your parents might be aliens? You're just reiterating Richard Dawkins on Expelled. Because why I think we should remain open-minded. Don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out. <laughs> when you find truth, lock around that. Okay, what would it take to convince you that two plus two is five? This is going to be an epiphany. Well, I guess I should remain open-minded to that. And I go, no! Don't be open-minded that two plus two is five. What would it take to convince you that rape is a morally beautiful thing? Well, that sounds a little bit more far-fetched. I said, more far-fetched than your parents might be aliens. What am I dealing with here? What are these college students being taught? And then people thought I wasn't being fair with them. So somebody came up to the microphone and told me so. You are not to correct people publicly. <laughs> Come again? Are you correcting me publicly? What is happening? We need to proclaim the truth. We need to leave the results to God. We need not be afraid. We need not be timid. You don't have a problem with me not having the truth. You have a problem with the God of truth. That's the problem. Because the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. I typically employ the Socratic method when a question is asked. And in a nutshell, it's just basically asking a question with a question. It causes critical thinking. Greg Bonson was so good at it, so much so one of his students asked him a question in one of his classes and said, hey, you know, I noticed that every time you ask a question, you answer it with another question. Why do you do that? And he said, why not? <laughs> you see, Asking good questions, which is what Jesus did continually, it will cause critical thinking, get somebody to think through their position. In fact, you can go through an entire conversation just merely asking questions. I encourage my, I have two, my oldest in my house, they're in college, a secular school. And I said, you know what, I'm going to teach you how to answer some really good questions with questions. And I'm going to get you to get the professor to give you push back on his heels that when they make an assertion, you can continually ask. How do you know that? <laughs> huh, I'm confused. Can you explain that a little? Just asking questions. They don't even know. They don't need to know what your worldview really is. You're just asking questions. Wait, how, how do you know that fossil is five million years old? I'm confused. Ah, that's a good question. Because right beneath that fossil, it's 10 million years old. Yeah, but how do you know that fossil underneath? Okay, this is five million, and uh, that layer underneath is 10 million. How do you know that's 10 million years old? Well, because that fossil is five million years old. 
Yeah, okay, circular reasoning. All right, so this is 5 million years old, and we know that's 5 million because this layer underneath is 10 million, and we know this is 10 million because this is 5 million. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Am I being punked? Is this candid camera? Are you hearing what you're saying? It doesn't make sense to me. It's okay to ask questions. Remember, remember, when an atheist asks a question, I remind him all the time, be careful with the questions you ask because there's answers. You ask all the questions you want, my friend, but remember, there's answers. And make sure your question is just that, a question, Mr. Atheist, not an assertion. Assertions have ramifications just as well, but when you say something that is factually incorrect, you're going to take me on a train ride to a faulty place. Your premise is faulty, therefore your conclusion is faulty. Let's backtrack a little bit and deal with our foundation. Christianity is unscientific. Miracles don't happen. Are you trying to tell me miracles, they can't happen because they're miraculous? Yeah, well, that was one of David Hume's explanations as well. He basically said they're impossible because they are impossible, yet he was still begging the question. Because if miracles, if God is real, well, then miracles are no big deal to God. Surely admit if God is real, then miracles are no big deal. Richard Dawkins, he said the universe that we observe has precisely the properties that we would expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. You're going to have to remember that as we are going to come back to that. I don't believe in God, and I'm just as good as any Christian. Maybe you watched this video with Pierce Morgan and Ricky Gervais. I think I have the right to say I'm not a believer in God, just like everyone has the right to believe in God, and they think the best way to do that is to take on Christian values, which, which you know, which preach immorality, and, um, um, but they haven't got the monopoly on, on good. This is my point. I'm not a Christian, but I live my life in a good way, and some people say, well, uh, who says what's good is? Well, do you know what? I do. You get to decide what good is? Maybe you should have lunch with Richard Dawkins, who said there is no good. There's no evil. There's no purpose. We're merely dancing to our own DNA. And this is the worldview of atheists. When they say there is no objective foundation for right and wrong, well, then everybody gets to decide all the way to the point where the, somebody says, like Richard Dawkins does here, that there is no good. There is no evil. Things just are what they are. It's like Doug Wilson when he said, it's like two weeds are growing up in a field. One is growing slightly to the right, the other one's growing slightly to the left. Which one is growing correctly? Huh? They're not growing correctly, they're just growing. It's like you and I. The decisions we make, if evolution is true, then it's goo to you by way of the zoo, and there is no right or wrong. We're just making decisions. I get to choose what good is. Moving along, running out of time, religion has caused more wars than anything else in history. Mm. When you think about it, religion has never really had a big problem with murder. <laughs> Not really. More people have been killed in the name of God than for any other reason. All you have to do... Shit. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, as an atheist, I would ask you, What's wrong with war? What's wrong with it? You have no objective foundation for right and wrong. The Pope of Atheism, Richard Dawkins, says there's no such thing as evil. What's wrong with war? God commanded genocide in the Old Testament. So what to you? Right. So what? You should be applauding God for getting rid of the weaker races. That's not my point of view but I will, for sake of argument, begin to lead them down a trail like that, depending on how contentious they really are. 
What's wrong? What's wrong with war? You can't tell me it's wrong. You can just merely say it's not your preference. And at that point, we're just arguing ice cream flavors. I like vanilla. I like chocolate. I like war. I don't like war. But you cannot tell me why it's wrong. War, W-A-R, we are right. But why is it wrong? Why is it wrong? Religion has caused more wars. Now, first of all, they're factually incorrect, aren't they? Religion has not caused more wars than anything else. Let the record show religion is actually number two. What is number one? Atheism. Communistic atheism. Lenin, Stalin, and Mao exterminated more than 100 million people in the 20th century alone. Not from a conviction that there is a God, but rather there is no God to answer to. Hmm. And we know that war caused in the name of Christianity is contrary to what Christianity teaches. If God is good, why is there evil and suffering in the world? I first ask them if they like Richard Dawkins, I'll remind them of that quote, hey, there is no evil. If God is good, why is there evil? Why is there suffering in the world? When I'm on the college campuses, I'll say, how many people would like to see God eradicate all the evil in the world? Yes. How many people would like to see God get rid of all the sex traffickers, all the rapists, all the murderers? Raise your hand nice and high. And, and people raise their hand nice and high. How many people would like to see God get rid of all the liars and thieves and covetous individuals? And all those who've lived contrary to the inner light that God has given to every man, woman, and child called a conscience. Not so many hands raised up now, is there? Why? Because your definition of evil is actually very low. Your standard of good is very low. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. No thief will inherit the kingdom of God. If God were to come at 12 o'clock to get rid of all the evil in the world, where would you be at 12.01? You have to realize, you like I, we're holding the smoking gun. Why is it more than likely God won't come back at 1201, though he might, and there's going to come a day where he will, and he'll quarantine evil, it's called hell, is because he's given people a chance to repent. That's why. He's not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. He's not willing for any to perish, but that all come to repentance, to a place where you agree with God that God is right and you're wrong. He's right, you're wrong. You're wrong. There is no evil. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it. He's a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Really? I'm sorry. Um, there's no evil. Richard? Hey, Rich, can I call you Rich? There is no such thing as evil. Why do you have a problem with God when there's no such thing as evil? And finally, wrapping it up, which is what I'm going to expand on in tomorrow's message, how do you share the gospel with an atheist? That's my session tomorrow. But the final point is the greatest need of the atheist. And the greatest need of the atheist is what you and I have experienced. That's where God and His omnipotence reach down into the dark cavern of our heart and he's willing to do it for others who are willing to confess and profess and obey. He's willing to do the one thing for them that they cannot do for themselves, and that is turn their heart towards him. They have to get born again. And you can argue all you want in an apologetical manner, but if you don't get to the gospel, you don't get to the good news, the life, death, burial, resurrection of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's no other true story where the hero dies for the villain. That's what they need. 
That's what you heard. So tickle the intellect. Get into that sword fight, but get to the gospel. Get to the gospel the way somebody did with you. And tomorrow we'll look in that and we're going to dissect it in all of its glory. Let's pray. And then I want to quickly share something with you. Father, thank you for these dear people who desire to make a difference in this life. May you, because of your covenant that you made with yourself, may you empower and strengthen. May you light a fire underneath us. We don't need a voice when we have a verse and you have told us to go and you have told us that you will be with us. Help us to stop with the excuses. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Quickly, uh, if you're not signed up for our newsletter um, or you're not familiar with our website, livingwaters.com. And if you sign up for our newsletter, uh, you'll get a, a free CD and a trip for two to Hawaii at your own expense. <laughs> but you can pick up the CD at, uh, at the table over there, The Way the Master, that's our television show. Um, and uh, finally, I, I wanted to let you know that we, we brought all kinds of things here, but I wanted to kind of highlight one main thing, and that's uh, this USB. We, we sell it on our website for $60, but we're making it available for $40, and it's filled with sermons by myself, Ray Comfort Easy. It's filled with sermon notes. Uh, you can uh, listen to me engage in conversation with telemarketers and see how I handle that, right? And I say, if you mess up, you just hang up and you move on. You get another call in just two minutes. That's the way they work. <laughs> but it's filled with the top answers to the top questions in greater detail in video format. Uh, it has uh, a lot of our films on there. Uh, it, it's got books in different languages. It's just filled. I call it the excuse eliminator. We don't want when you die to hand God a bucket of excuses, right? Why you never stepped into the batter's box, why you never stepped out onto the crashing sea. It doesn't matter how tumultuous the storm is when your eyes are on the Lord, right? Uh, if you're going to fail, fail by falling forward. You know, open up your mouth as you ought. And that's what this is. It works in computers, some smart tablets, uh, some cars. Yeah, it, it really, it's, it's, it's amazing. So it's $40, but let me also say this, that if you cannot afford $40, um, God's not freaking out how He's going to provide this resource for you. Just like He's not wondering where your next meal is going to come from, right? You consider the lilies of the fields and the birds of the air. God takes care of all of them. We've highlighted that verse. We underline it twice. We need to just kind of realize that God's going to take care of all of our needs. What did Randy Elkhorn say? God does not bless me financially to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. It's not about building bigger barns and bigger kingdoms here. So if you can't afford $40, well, then whatever you can't afford, and if you can't afford anything at all, it's free. Free. No strings attached. No questions asked from the person behind the table. Just come by and pick up that USB and say, hey, praise God. You know, and if somebody begins to question, you go, <laughs> and you take that USB and you keep on going. We want you to become equipped. Equipped. And you can do so. Um, that, that's the, it's the ultimate collection. It's filled with stuff. Out of time. If you want to stay in contact uh, with me, um, if you want to stalk, that's how you do it. Um, but uh, God bless you, and we have somebody give some closing remarks and to correct all the heresy I just sent. Uh. Give Mark a hand. So good, so powerful, and again, so thankful for their heart for the gospel. Amen. All right, we are going to take a 20-minute break, all right? And when you come back, we'll have Dr. Nathaniel Jensen giving a presentation, give you a brief summary of that here in a moment. And then before he starts, we'll have, of course, Michael O'Brien singing about 10 or 15 minutes before that. So take a quick break, but we'll officially start back in 20 minutes. But Michael O'Brien will start singing before then. So break, we'll see you very soon. <laughs> 